Okay, hi there. Welcome uh, to a macro video where we're going to be thinking about what measures the UK government might be able to use to prevent the economy experiencing mass unemployment in the wake of the COVID-19 public health crisis. So a quick question to start with, what is the unemployment rate? We're going to be thinking about this number quite a bit in this video. It is the proportion or the percentage of the economically active population who are unemployed. And to be economically active, you have to be either in work or available and seeking work in the labour market. Uh, we're going to be thinking about mass unemployment. Uh, is there a hard and fast definition of this? Probably not, but uh, officially it's uh, when at least one person in 10 in the labour market is out of work. In practice, the true level of unemployment is often significantly higher than this because of lots of hidden unemployment in the economy. We typically associate mass unemployment with the Great Depression that afflicted the United States in the early 1930s. It was a depression that lasted the best part of three and a half years, uh, saw real GDP fall by at least a quarter, nearly production in the industries falling by nearly a half, share prices collapsing and critically unemployment rising uh, to nearly 25%, which we can see in this chart. It was a dramatic and an incredible increase in unemployment, such that at the peak, over one person in four was out of work. That rate then fell, but uh, uh, remained above 15% essentially until the war. A more modern day example would be the economic slump associated with Greece in the aftermath of the global economic crisis from 2007 onwards. As you can see in the chart here, unemployment surged to more than 25% of the labour force and youth unemployment at one point reached nearly 60% of people aged between 18 and 24 years old. So what has happened to unemployment in the UK? Well, this chart covers the annual unemployment rate as a percentage from 1971 onwards. And it's probably worth noting here the slight decline in the peaks of unemployment in the early 1970s, early 1980s, early 1990s, and again, the most recent recession. So there were hopes, certainly recently, that each time unemployment peaked during a recession, the rate was coming down and the labour market was essentially improving its performance. Uh, but um, forecasts for the labour market are, have become very gloomy indeed in recent weeks. I was picking up the latest OECD forecast came out in June, pretty much matches what the IMF have said. Uh, they predict that real GDP in the UK will fall by over 10% in 2020. And it thinks by the end of this year, end of 2020, the rate of unemployment will be 9.7% of the labour force, essentially heading back up to the levels last seen in the early 1990s. Uh, we can see the impact of the, the great lockdown in this new research from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the IFS. Uh, the chart here shows that both median household incomes and um, total employment have declined sharply since the middle of March. Household income, including welfare, was down 8%. The number of jobs was 4% lower. And both are indicative of a severe contraction in, in GDP. The UK economy is in clearly in deep recession. And there's been a very steep increase in claimant count unemployment. This is the number of people eligible to claim the job seekers allowance. And that's jumped by more than a million in the last few months. So clearly there are significant fears that <clears throat> what is a, undoubtedly a recession could become something worse than that mass unemployment might return to the UK. Lots of explanations as to how a recession can become a depression. Obviously, we saw in March and April the stop, the lockdown, people told to stay at home and distant, social distancing and shops and factories closed down. Uh, that is now starting to see that feed through to an increase in unemployment, wage incomes for households falling, business and consumer confidence has taken a, a dive. And then economists start talking about how this can lead to negative multiplier effects. So if, if employment and incomes are declining, uh, people are delaying their spending, perhaps saving more because of a fear of unemployment, uh, they spend less. And then within the circular flow, 
that then leads to a drop in orders for things like component parts and raw materials and other other items. So the economy, in theory, uh, can contract even more because of what's known as negative multiplier effects. So businesses may decide to cancel or postpone investment, capital investment spending, and that might lead then to a fall in demand for orders for new machinery and equipment and hardware and software. Supply chain industries themselves may also cut back on investment. <clears throat> and then the risk, the big risk, of course, is this becomes systemic. Businesses start to fail, bank debts, bad debts go up in the banking system. Uh, that makes commercial banks even more reluctant, perhaps, to lend to smaller businesses and others in the economy. So there is clearly a fear that the recession the UK is in could deepen, could worsen, and mass unemployment could be the consequence. The bulk of that initially would be cyclical unemployment. Uh, you know, an increase in, uh, well, let's say, for example, unemployment goes up to 10% by the end of this year. That would be an increase of around 2, 2.1 million people take unemployment to above 3 million. Now, a large a large part of that will be cyclical unemployment. Uh, unemployment due to a lack of a deficiency of aggregate demand for goods and services. The fear is that people who lose their jobs in the current crisis may then find it difficult to find re-employment. There are lots of structural barriers to, that prevent the unemployed finding new work. So the fear is that cyclical unemployment goes up uh, but that structural unemployment then then follows uh, in the months and years ahead. We can show the effect of a recession using a simple aggregate demand and supply diagram. Here we show an inward shift of aggregate demand causing a fall in real national output, uh, and that, of course, leads to a fall in, in employment because the demand for labour is derived from the demand for output. And again, the risk is that as unemployment goes up, certain groups... Certain regions, certain industries are more badly affected than others. One of the big fears, of course, of a return, at least in the short term, to mass unemployment are the so-called scarring effects this might have on millions of people, particularly younger folks starting out in the labour market after leaving school, college or university. Recent research has shown, for example, that people starting their careers in, a, in an economic recession typically experience... Uh, a fall in real pay of around 6% after one year and uh, wages don't recover for up to up to six years. Well, how can mass unemployment be prevented? What are the options? What are the, po the possibilities <clears throat> for preventing this surge in unemployment, which many people are fearing, particularly when the furlough scheme uh, comes to an end? Keynes would have something to say about this. He was strong on the economics of psychology, the macroeconomics of of changes in animal spirits, uh, the optimism or the pessimism amongst businesses and consumers that drives our spending, saving, and investment decisions. He understood that fears of a slump can actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy because people save more, demand and the circular flow goes down, and that generates less output and fewer jobs. And when private sector demand collapses, then Keynes would argue or argued that the government needs to intervene essentially using an activist fiscal policy to protect jobs. So, for example, the furlough scheme would be a good example of that. But crucially also to stimulate the economy in the hope of, of uh, lifting private sector demand as well. So what are some of the short-term options? Uh, here are a few. One would be for the government to cut employment taxes. Uh, the main one would be employers' national insurance. Uh, employers pay national insurance contributions on each of the people they they take on. So a cut in national insurance would essentially bring down the cost of employing people and hopefully mitigate some of the damage. A lot of newspaper articles suggesting that the government is going to bring uh, forward uh, higher government spending on infrastructure projects. So they're going to try and increase the number of projects which are started this year and next year in, in areas such as house building and roads uh, and transport. Another option would be for the government to inject more money into the circular flow through cuts in direct and indirect taxation, perhaps an increase in income tax allowances, perhaps a cut in VAT to support aggregate demand and lift consumer spending. I suppose on the monetary policy side, of course, it's highly likely that we will continue to have very low interest rates and the Bank of England will be using quantitative easing 
to inject more money into the banking system. But then, of course, we have to think about medium term as we come through the crisis, hopefully uh, we move into 2021 and beyond. How can you sustain and improve employment uh, beyond the immediate uh, issues? Again, lots of options here. One would be to lift investment in human capital, the skills, the qualifications, the experiences of the labour force, increase funding, for example, for STEM subjects, uh, bring in a much more activist regional policy to promote investment, new investment in deprived areas, perhaps use a job guarantee scheme for younger workers who face tough times, and indeed accelerate the shift, which we'll talk about in a second, towards the industries and towards the jobs of the future in software and health and social care and perhaps in green investment. Just want to give you a couple of good examples of, of countries which have done some interesting things. Denmark for some years now has essentially had a youth guarantee. I think it came in in 2013. Uh, it's been reinforced since that all young people under the age of 30 uh, should receive by right a good quality offer of, of a job continued education and apprenticeship within four months of becoming unemployed or leaving formal education. So Denmark's a good example here of using supply-side policies intertwined with fiscal policy to provide a, a kind of youth guarantee underpinning the human capital of younger workers in the labour force. And Denmark has relatively low youth unemployment and a relatively low unemployment rate amongst all adult workers as well. Uh, this is a really interesting scheme in Germany. So Germany uh, has a scheme, a social, a social insurance programme uh, designed to keep people in work during a recession. Essentially, employers reduce their hours, the hours they offer to employees, instead of laying them off, so they cut the hours. The German government then steps in with an income replacement rate of 60%. So a worker receives 60% of his or her pay for the hours not worked, while receiving full pay for the hours worked. So a worker would only experience maybe a 10% salary loss for a 30% reduction in hours. And the aim is twofold. One is to keep people in work during an economic crisis, for example. And secondly, to protect workers' incomes and therefore underpin aggregate demand because workers, fewer workers are losing their jobs Therefore, they have less incentive to save on a precautionary basis. It also means, of course, that the businesses retain the human capital of the people they've employed. They avoid the cost of rehiring and retraining new workers. So in, in Denmark, they've gone for a job guarantee. In Germany, they've gone for employment protection. These are two good applied examples to use. The Green Alliance in the UK has just published a report I've tweeted, uh, shown a link here from Roger Harabin from the BBC, arguing that one option for the UK is to really drive forward green investment over the next few years as a catalyst for creating new jobs. They argue, the Green Alliance argues, for retrofitting buildings, simple things like getting people employed to fit home insulation, loft insulation, etc., creating many more new cycle lanes, Investment in electric ferries, new battery factories, green investment in reforestation, um, building more charging stations, more electric buses, small scale upgrades to railway systems, opening new stations and lines, etc. I mean, there is a big agenda here. They argue that £14 billion a year is needed for the climate. Uh, but their argument is that these kind of schemes are labour intensive. Uh, they can be highly regional specific. They can target areas of high unemployment and perhaps make perhaps make a big difference. Overall, uh, it is true that the main driver of employment is demand, demand for goods and services. So the crucial policy to prevent mass unemployment is for government, Bank of England, to pursue policies which maintain a sufficient level of aggregate demand. Monetary policy is likely to keep interest rates close to zero. Further rounds of quantitative easing are likely. The big fear is that the furlough scheme, which ends late summer, early autumn, will lead to a lot of big spike in job losses. This is the crucial period for the UK. So will firms shed lots of workers? The answer is probably yes, in which case perhaps a short-term cut in employment taxes is the favoured approach. 
And if you can find those smaller scale labour intensive infrastructure projects that can start reasonably quickly, this could be one of the key ways to prevent mass, un mass unemployment. Well, these are challenging times for the UK economy, and but hopefully uh, this video has given you a few ideas as to what some other policy options are available to the UK government during the crisis. Okay, thank you very much indeed.